All right, this section we're talking about solving quadratic equations. Now, all of this should be a review for you. Yeah. Uh huh. Remember what a quadratic equation looks like. Your most basic form for a quadratic equation is this guy. A x squared plus b x plus c is equal to zero. This is an equation. With equations, there are things that you can do that you can't necessarily do with expressions. In an equation, what you do to one side of the equation, you can do to the other side, right? You can add the same thing on both sides. You can multiply the same thing on both sides. But if you have an expression, not an equation, but if you have an expression, there's no two sides. You can only do what's there. Now, here's the, the, the key, key thing that if we don't have this, we can't really go anywhere else. This is the zero factor theorem. I believe the book calls it the zero factor property, but we call it the zero factor theorem. Remember what it says? It says that if you have a product that equals zero, then our conclusion is that A is equal to zero, B equals zero, or both factors are zero. That's what the zero factor theorem says. So the first thing we ever did when we were solving these quadratic equations was that we factored. So if I ask you to solve 4x squared plus 36x equals 40. In order for us to use the zero factor theorem, the words tell us exactly what we need to do. It has to be equal to zero. You then factor and then you apply the theorem that we have outlined right here. So this equation that I have is not equal to zero, so what do I need to do? I need to move the 40 over so it looks like my normal quadratic equation. Okay. Now, since this equals zero, I need to factor. So that word factor is, it says a lot. Because what's the first thing we do when we factor? Remember, the first thing you do when you factor, you got to factor out. What? The greatest common factor. You guys have no life in you. This is really sad. So how does, is there a greatest common factor here? What is it? It's four. If I factor out the 4, what's left? x squared plus 9x minus 10 is equal to 0. And then I finish factoring this guy. This is a nice trinomial. x plus 10 and x minus 1. Now before I go on here, as a recall for you, how many solutions am I expecting to get from this equation? Two. Two. What tells you two, equa uh, two solutions? Square. I have an exponent of two. This is a polynomial equation. In polynomial equations, the exponent, the highest exponent, the degree of your polynomial, tells you how many solutions I expect. I expect two. Now, according to the zero factor theorem, I get a solution from this guy. So when x minus 1 is equal to 0, or when x plus 10 is equal to 0, that's what the zero factor theorem says. It says that one of these factors has to be 0. Now why am I not doing anything with the 4? Hmm. 4, does it ever equal 0? No. Never. It's not a variable expression. Therefore, it cannot contribute to our solutions. Now, if x plus 10 is equal to 0, that happens when x equals what? <coughs> or here, x minus 1 equals 0 happens when x equals what? When x equals positive 1. How many solutions do I have? I've got 1, and I've got 2. What do you guys think? 
You know what? Let's go ahead and check and we see. Can ever get them where? I mean, we're gonna right where? They're not. In what circumstances do we have to check for restrictions? Right. Some equations that we're going to come across, and we'll see more of these uh, tomorrow. When you have an equation that has radicals, you have to check those because radicals have limitations. When I use that square root symbol, that only returns the positive square root. When I have fractions, when my denominators have variables, I have to watch out for restricted values. When things are normal polynomial equations and they're quadratic, the answers we get should be right. But you know what? We talked, excuse me, <coughs> yesterday about how we can check our work. So let's, let's do that. Let me just slide this guy over. Now I say, and I'm, I'm going to maintain that these are my solutions, right? <coughs> if I store <coughs> negative 10 into x, okay? Now don't hit enter. You know where we had the i above the decimal? If I press alpha instead of second, <coughs> I get this colon. Now what this colon will do is it will separate commands in your calculator. So the first thing I'm telling it to do is to store negative 10 into x, and then I want to evaluate 4x squared plus 36x. What in my original equation is 4x squared plus 36x supposed to equal? 40. 40. And it does. If I were to store 1 into <coughs> x, you know what? I don't want to do that. <coughs> I want to go back to what I talked about the other day. If I press second entry, I get that last result, <coughs> or the, the last thing that I typed in, right? If I take off the negative and I take off the zero, that's storing one into that, I still get 40. Do you all agree? What was the other thing that we said that we could do to check our work? We could do that. We'd have to store it in and then type in the whole equation. You know, zero is false, one is true. But if you go to your solver, here we go to math, and you press up, and that goes to the bottom of the list, which is solver. Zero equals, let's see. You see here that zero equals, because I already had to move everything over. So that's 4x <coughs> squared plus 36x minus 40. Now, if this is the very first time that you've typed in the equation, it's going to give you one of the solutions at the very beginning. But what did I say we should do to get the other ones? Go negative 10 Go positive and negative 10. So if I say, you know, let me check <coughs> at positive 10. The closest solution to 10 is, well, it gives me 0.9 repeating, which is the same thing as 1, right? What if I check at negative 10? What do you get? Oh, the answer actually is negative 10. Just what we expected to happen, right? <coughs>